Thank you, Miles, uh, colleagues, friends. I don't figure that Guyana has, I don't figure the problem is so much of a technical one, technical, legal, constitutional. But I believe, and if I were to disagree with Haslin, that the problem is the two large ethnic blocks. Not how they see themselves, but how they are seen by each other. And some time ago, if you will permit me to quote myself, but it's written in a way that I can't, that I can't repeat it. The existence of two large ethnic blocks which harbor historic suspicions and resentments about each other and which seek security in organizational form through political parties is the sole singular and fundamental issue that has been at the core of all Guyana's civil and political turmoil and instability since 1955. So it's not only the existence of the two blocks, it's how they organize themselves politically. That's the second aspect of the problem. And the existence of these two blocks and the way they're politically organized has created a political culture in Guyana, a certain type of negative political culture. And if you examine it, it's one political culture, not two. The two parties don't have a separate culture. Each has the same culture. They straddle. They both straddle the same culture. And I would like to see the back of that culture broken by the current government, by it undertaking constitutional reform. The culture says that the government would not be interested. That's what the culture says that the government would not be interested in constitutional reform, having got into power, and the constitution suits them now. But I hope that that does not happen, and that this government breaks away from that culture, and adheres to its promise to undertake constitutional reform. And what is the reform I'm talking about? In our process in 1999-2000, a very big issue arose as to shared governance and how we would institutionalize shared governance. There is a lot of discussion about it. And, um, uh, Ma James McAllister, Sherwood Lowe, and a few others of the younger people had come to the commission and proposed shared governance, and they had a, a document that detailed how it would work. The Problem with that, there are two problems. One was that the two main political parties were not interested. The PVP, having been interested in it in 1978, after 1992, and they got into power, they were no longer interested in it. And the second problem was it would have been a very messy construction in the Constitution to put it in, in, in words, it probably would not have worked. No one tried it. We were talking about the principle, and because the parties did not, um, the main parties did not accept it, the we didn't go beyond principle. But two years later, in 2002, Desmond Hoyt announced that he now supports shared governance. Uh, well, he did nothing else. Apart from making the statement, he said and did nothing more. <laughs> so here we are today, and the system that we have resulted in 2011 in a government which had a minority of the votes at the elections 
and a minority of the seats in the National Assembly holding political office. Nominally democratically, but we know that that's, how, that's not how democracy ought to work. When you have such a situation, there is usually a small political party staying in the opposition but offering its support to the government. So they have a majority to pass legislation. Now that is the situation, that is the problem that we need to solve. That's the problem. And the current constitution makes it impossible for two political parties to come together before the elections, except they have one slate. So that's, um, that's a problem that we have inherited and we did not resolve in 1999, 2000. In the British Constitution, what we call the Independence Constitution, the president, who was a ceremonial president, had the power after elections to appoint the government. That is perhaps the only substantive authority that the president had, the power to appoint the government. He had the power to call on the party which he felt <clears throat> would command the support of the majority of the members of the National Assembly to form the government. When we look at the president, and I wrote an article <clears throat> excising the presidential carbunclets on my blog, um, talking in detail about that and the issues arising and surrounding that. If we need to look at the presidential system, then this is the opportune time, by the way, for these things to happen, because we had always been talking about this shared governance, publicly and privately, and having a great difficulty with it because of this issue of, that Henry mentioned, the opposition, and how are you going to persuade one of the main political parties to give up power and invite the other one, give up some power and invite the other one, and so on. It was not feasible. Until Henry began to talk about the issue of the system and how the system can work. Because we have developing now a situation where neither of the major political parties will get over 50% by themselves. No. And therefore, the parties might be better positioned to contemplate a system which can aid both of them. Because unless they see, our political culture tells us that unless they see a benefit for each of them in any change. They're not going to countenance it. One is, Henry has talked about this, it's actually his idea. I first heard it from him. A separate election for the president with a 50% plus one majority. In other words, if he gets below that, there will be a runoff. So it forces negotiations and coalitions at that level. If a president does not get 50%, he has to go to either one of the smaller parties or the two large parties have to negotiate a power sharing arrangement before the runoff elections. Or Election of the president by the National Assembly after the elections, either by a 50% plus one vote or a two-third majority. That might be difficult. 
because we, we uh, the, Suriname doesn't have a two-third majority, but there's a great problem there sometimes to get a majority to support their president. So perhaps a majority might be sufficient difficulty. Those two ideas, I suggest, will, will in our developing political scenario force our political parties to seek alliances among either smaller parties, but if encouraged, between the two major parties. And I think that will reduce the kind of political problems we had which arose over the 2011 elections, and they helped to, help to encourage coalitions and alliances. I don't believe the day will come soon. I know it will come eventually, but it will not come soon where we will have significant cross-ethnic voting. That's an ideal we should always strive for. But in the meantime, we need to try and build alliances. Now, will the opposition participate in this? And is it realistic to move forward with constitutional reform without the opposition, the de facto opposition? They're not the the jury opposition yet. I think, in my view, that the constitutional reform process should proceed without the PPP. Because if it proceeds along the lines that I hope that it would, then they would be able to easily convince the electorate that the change changes along the line I suggest, or any other reasonable changes, would be good for the country. And I believe that the electorate will support such change. If not, what do we do? Wait for an optimal situation, political situation, to emerge, which will never emerge? This process is going to go on and on and on and on. And unless we take the bull by the horns now and go for it, then we will not allow APNU to say that it cannot proceed because the PPP is not cooperating. I think we should hold APNU's feet to the fire. And I'm watching it. What should the mode of reform be? That is one mode the Constitution Reform Committee. Because inbuilt in it, you heard Haslin saying this, inbuilt in it is the power to expand the committee by inviting experts on it. The other method is the 1980 method, which was a resolution of the National Assembly converting it into a constituent assembly. That happens Notwithstanding the great controversies surrounding 1980 and the process at that time in Guyana, the Constituent Assembly is a, a mechanism that has been used in other countries. So you have the Constituent converting the National Assembly into a Constituent Assembly to discuss only the, to write a constitution. And then you have a process that we were governed by in 1999-2000, and what happened then was a Constitution Reform Commission Act was passed. In what, surprisingly, the two main political parties agreed to the legislation and agreed that a number of organizations will be represented on the Constitution Reform Commission. And representatives of those organizations were nominated. And we worked and came to conclusions, came to agreements. The problem with that process was 
we did not write the constitution because we did not have the time. Uh, what in if if this a similar process is adopted, then the same group or another group should actually write the constitution and then present it to the National Assembly. As has been said, the constitution change a constitution cannot be fixed for time immemorial, and no constitution can, can accommodate or can be un, unchangeable. But we did not complete the job in 2000, and we did not complete the job because the parties could not agree. And the completion of the job involves the establishment of a political system in Guyana that takes account of the nature of our political organization, that is, the support of our two large political parties by the two large ethnic groups. A system which accommodates that and allows a government to be established which obtains the support of the vast majority of the people. In other words, a government that is considered, or a government which is accepted after being elected by 51, 52, or whatever percent, or a president, that's accepted, not supported, but accepted as the legitimate representative of our country. That is what we want. And that does not happen today, and it's a big problem. Thank you very much.